All right. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. If it's the middle of the night somewhere, good evening there too. Uh, but thank you all for joining today. Uh, our webinar this week is going to be on how to get started with CockroachDB. Um, but before we get started, uh, let me actually, I'm going to, I'm going to turn the camera on for a second so that on the next slide, there's nice black and white photos of us, but there we are live. Um, we are real people. We are real people. Um, this is my friend, Tim, baby shark veil. Did, 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 did it? Never mind. Um, I am Jim Walker. I am a product marketing here. Tim is a sales engineer. Um, and so before we get started, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I, please do ask us questions along the way. Uh, there is a QA panel. Uh, um, I'll be working with Charlotte here in the room to make sure that we, we get the questions and feed them into Tim. Or if I can answer them, I'll try to answer them as well. Um, at the end of the webinar, we will conduct a survey. Uh, we love feedback. We've gotten some really good feedback has made us change uh, the way we do things here. So. Uh, we'd love to get back that from you. And before you ask, yes, definitely a recording of this webinar um, will actually, will absolutely be available. There'll be some good links at the end and some uh, value, uh, value news, um, uh, going forward too, to, to get started with Cockroach yourself. So with that, I'm going to jump into a little bit of a setup here and then Tim's going to do, Tim's going to do a quick demo. So I'm not going to subject him to our faces for too much. No, yeah, we can turn okay. the video off. Okay, good. But hi. <laughs> Okay, so, um, you know, a lot has changed over the past couple of years. You know, I've been seeing kind of cloud adoption happen over the past kind of, you know, five to six years, build and build and build as companies kind of race to, uh, you know, erase kind of OpEx and move to CapEx and like the whole cost structures of, of what's going on and everything. And I think today the, the practical reality is everything is being deployed to the cloud either you're self-hosted in terms of it's your own cloud which basically is typically hosted by one of the cloud providers or you're using just public cloud ecs or you know gcp compute or whatever that is right um and and honestly pretty much everything has moved to the cloud and, and i think you know the various different pieces of of our of our application stack have all kind of migrated to the cloud as well. You know, we see the advent of Kubernetes for orchestration and we have the advent of containers and being able, you know, the flexibility to deploy anywhere, this sort of things. Um, there's, there's a couple layers though that, that I think are struggling. And so when we get to storage, I think people still struggle with. And for us here, you know, well, we're a database company, you know, the database itself is actually a, a really big piece of this equation. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, uh, Merv Adrian is, a, is an old friend, somebody I've known for quite some years and somebody I look up to and respect. Um, and I, you know, he had a, he had a, a, a post that came out a couple of weeks ago. It said, you know, the future of the database management system is cloud and that any sort of like on-prem or legacy type capability is a thing of the past and, and really a, a special requirement. And, and I couldn't agree with him more. And I think, I think we're all seeing this um, as people raise to move their applications to the cloud, you know, what is that database that they're going to use with that and becoming cloud native and actually deploying things in, in that way is, is, is paramount to the success of many of these organizations. So, you know, we're seeing that, but you know, when you move to the cloud and you start using containers and you start going down the path of distributed systems, it's difficult. It's, uh, it is a new paradigm. Uh, in fact, myself, you know, I'm kind of originally a client server and then web servers and all these things. It was a paradigm shift for me to start to understand Kubernetes and how all these things work. The complexity is high. Um, but I would argue that in any distributed system, especially around data, there are two essential truths of which need to be combated when we start thinking about a database in the cloud. Um, and when we have distributed systems and we have you know, applications and services that are distributed across an entire planet, um, there's two big challenges that come into play, especially around the database. Number one is the speed of light. So this is actually the person here. I can't ever say his name because he's got an O in his name that I can't pronounce. Roar, 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 roar. Um, Sounds good. Wikipedia, good. exactly. I'll go with it. Um, so there is the speed of light. So you know there's going to be latencies as you have applications accessing data from different parts of the planet. Um, so if you have a single node of a database or a single instance of a database running, say, on the west coast of the U.S. or somewhere in Portugal, you know uh, the the applications that have to access that have to deal with the speed of light. So how do we make data accessible on every corner of the world? Um, but set the expectable, you know, the, the, uh, an acceptable rate for uh, access, right? So that's a speed of light problem. And so how do you actually approach the speed of light in terms of uh, reducing latency in distributed systems? Now in a database, there's lots of things that have to happen. It's, it's one of the big things that we architect to here at, at, at Cockroach Labs, our core team uh, and, and some of our engineers led, led by Andy Kimball and some other, Pete Mattis, a bunch of guys, 
um, you know, they, they focus heavily on this, the speed of light problem and how do we optimize latencies to that, that goal. Now, the other thing that's going to happen is everything fails. I think Werner Vogels even says on stage, right, uh, you know, the CTO of AWS, everything's going to fail. And it, it does. And that just happened to them last week. There was a whole data center that went out for Amazon, I think, right? So these things happen. Um, and so how do you protect yourself and your applications from failure? How do you minimize RPO and RTO, these recovery points, right? Um, they cost money. Um, and, and in some certain mission critical applications, you know, architecting against failure is, is extremely difficult. Now, doing that with the database, with legacy databases, we just believe that, that that's, that's ridiculously difficult to do. Um, and, you know, Cockroach Labs, what we've done is we've architected something from the ground up to really meet the needs or, or to really kind of, you know, balance the, these two essential truths with usability and, and providing true SQL and serializable isolation and lots of things that, that we'll talk a little bit more about um, in a database. And so for us, it's, you know, there's a combination of this world of everybody moving to the cloud. When you get there, there's these distributed systems and there's two essential truths that you have to actually fight. Uh, and so we're here to fight those, those truths for your database. And that, that's really kind of what we've architected. Now, there is an emerging class of product that, uh, that, that is that's focused on this problem. Um, you know, we call it distributed SQL. I think some of these solutions were dumped into a larger category called new SQL, but I, I find new SQL to not be um, representative of what's going on. This is truly distributed systems and, and truly SQL. So, you know, doing these things is not simple. And there is like some core kind of requirements from the database itself to, to, to meet this next evolution. And, you know, number one, if it's database, you're going to do anything relational. It, it's got to speak SQL. So I think that's just table stakes, right? Um, if we're going to actually do this, we're going to have distributed systems. It's one thing to, you know, get flexibility, but inflexibility is complexity. And so we don't want to add yet another layer of complexity to your microservices and all your new applications uh, for the database. We want to keep it as simple as, you know, implementing Postgres or MySQL is today. We want, you know, how do you actually erase that? And in fact, we want to actually make it even more simple than that. We don't want you to have to actually deal with manual sharding or any of those things. So, you know, we don't want to have to deal with active passive setups and all these things like, let's actually erase all of that complexity. Let's let the database deal with some of those things in a more automated way and the way that distributed systems are designed and architected. If we're going to be a distributed system, well, it's got to be everywhere, right? It's got to be, you need to be able to replicate it into any region of the world. Um, and it needs to be extremely resilient. I think that's, you know, fighting the everything fails thing is, is paramount to what we do here. And then finally, if you're or actually not finally, I have one more after that, right? If it's going to be hard EBS, um, asset compliance is, is huge. And doing asset compliance and to the level that we're doing, we're actually implementing, you know, serializable isolation. So this isn't like eventually consistent, but a truly consistent database um, at distributed scale, difficult to do. And so, you know, I feel that these are core requirements of a distributed SQL database. Now, this last one gets really important because it gets into the speed of light issue. Um, if you're going to have data that's globally accessible or even two regions, multi-region, I, I, one region, two, ten, uh, you know, having that data close to where it needs to be accessed, either the user or the app or however it's going to be used, um, and architecting your implementation of the database to, to meet those needs is, is really critical. So being able to take at the row level, being able to tie data to a particular location, to me, is just a, it's, a, it's a requirement to do distributed SQL. Um, anybody can do two regions, you start to do three, start to do four, uh, and latencies become a big problem. And so this is one of those things that, you know, part and part here at Cockroach Labs um, is, is really critical. And, and I feel as we, as we venture out into this new distributed world, you know, the speed of light is actually something that, that is a, it's a real thing. Uh, and so uh, how do we actually combat that? And so, you know, this is the kind of core kind of understanding of what that is. So before we get started on kind of how to get started with Cockroach, I just wanted to give you that, the core requirements of what we're working to, but then give you a little sense of the architecture itself of, you know, how we actually went about this. You know, to us, in a truly distributed system, there's shared nothing. This isn't like a database that has distributed storage underneath and a bunch of nodes on top of it for read access and whatnot. No, I mean, this is truly like architected under the principles of something like, you know, the way like Kubernetes is architected, a similar way, right? Shared nothing, right? These sort of things. Um, and, and, and completely atomic in its own, in its own being, right? And so at the, at the core of what we do is a database, uh, you know, an instance of CockroachDB that takes part in a cluster 
is the same binary no matter where you're at. In fact, every binary, every instance is going to be able to do the same thing. So this isn't like there's transaction nodes and storage nodes and different types of things. It's one single instance, and it's the same thing for all of them. And in that is all of the capabilities you would also expect in the database around security, around management, um, around integration. Uh, build in a cost-based optimizer that works in this new world, right? These sort of things that, that come expected in a database. Um, but it could, you, could, you, could, you could deploy an instance, one instance of CockroachDB and use that as a SQL database behind an application. Um, you know, the resilient thing actually comes into play when you start to do three to four nodes because that's where we're replicating data. So if you lose one, right, um, we're still going to have, you know, copies of that data in other places. So, you know, I mean, the, the true value of what we do really comes into a clustered environment. Now, the beauty of, of, of CockroachDB is that it's really simple. We just spin up a node pointed at the cluster and it's going to take part in that. Now, I'll come back to that, but every node in that cluster is also a single consistent gateway to the rest of the database. So data that's stored and a node that's in Jersey can be accessed by an application that's accessing the data through some node that sits in California. It's okay because that is basically virtually one big database and it, it knows how to access the data no matter where it lives uh, across that entire cluster. And so kind of a really important concept in, in, in CockroachDB, one of that, that once I understood things made a whole lot more sense to me. So you just set load balancers in front of each region. It doesn't matter where the data lives. The database actually just takes care of finding that. Now, as I noted, we could, we could, as I, as I noted, you know, we could take a node, spin it up. And as long as I have a TLS connection pointed at the rest of the cluster, it just kind of take part in this, this thing called global coordination, which, you know, this is, this is where things get tricky in distributed systems. How do we coordinate transactions? How do I, you know, when, when one transaction happens in one part of the world on an account, and, in, and another transaction happens in, 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 you know, across the globe on the same record at the same time, who wins, right? The, the database should deal with those conflicts and does. And, and, and we've taken, you know, we've gone to great lengths to not only do that and, and, and coordinate that, but to do it at an acceptable um, performance point. Um, and there's lots of things that we've done under the covers that are great. And so, um, the other kind of cool part of what we're doing is, well, remember I said we could just spin up a node and the database is actually going to rebalance. Um, so we're going to optimize for load or we'll optimize for utilization or storage or whatever that is. The database itself can actually deal with that and actually level out. Uh, so we have equal load across the entire cluster. It's really beautiful. But then if a node goes down, it's also smart enough to understand, hey, I lost data. So let's, let's make sure I have three copies of that data. I'm not going to get too deep into that right now. But it'll actually repair itself too, which is, which is phenomenal. Which kind of lends to, you know, we can do things like rolling upgrades, spin a node down, spin a node up. We can actually have different versions of the software running throughout an entire cluster, uh, backwards compatible up to two versions. Uh, and so we, we do that. And there's some cool things. And then, you know, attaching data to a location is, is like I was talking about, important for uh, latencies, um, but, but incredibly important for some use cases around some people actually want to use this for compliance so that, you know, data that was created in some country just lives in that country or you know, when California gets their kind of GDPR like laws, you know, is data that's created in California live in California? Uh, accessible from the whole world, but is it living there? Right? And, and can the database actually deal with that? And that, that's stuff that we do um, with it pretty well. Uh, and, and I think a lot, of, a lot of organizations are attracted to us uh, for that and, and, and that and that particular use case. And then finally, um, you know, spinning up a node and pointing it at a cluster is kind of an interesting concept. In fact, Tim's going to spin up a node here. We'll show you how to get started. We could point that at a cluster that's already running in AWS, and it would start to participate in that cluster. Things would start to be balanced, and you know, it, 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 data would be able to accessible. Like the, it, the beauty of that. So we are actually inherently multi-cloud. We see lots of organizations doing hybrid cloud. I think that's just multi-cloud. Um, you know, and where they have a database that's on-prem and in the cloud, and they're able to basically segment which data is living on-prem versus in the cloud as well. We can also segment things like network traffic as well, so that. Only certain traffic is actually, you know, going back and forth between these environments, but it is, but it's acting as a single database. Again, each node is a single consistent gateway, so it has access to all of it, right? And so, um, you know, that's the, the kind of the, the, the high level architecture and kind of what distributed SQL is and kind of why we're here. So I will no longer tell marketing PowerPoints and now is I will let you, it is finally your turn, Tim. So, wow. yeah, so a, a couple things I thought I would, um, Kind of walk walk you through how to get started very very quickly running a, a cockroach cluster now as jim said we are very much infrastructure agnostic we can run 
on-prem, we can run in containers, we can run in the cloud, doesn't really matter to us. But the example I'm gonna walk through today is how to get up and running very quickly in Kubernetes. Um, and there's a couple kind of um, doc pieces of documentation or, or things that I would point you to, um, and we'll certainly set a follow-up with these links. I'm gonna go through um, uh, the process of starting a local cluster, uh, cockroach cluster using Kubernetes. Uh, this is very, very well documented in our excellent documentation site. Uh, this link will be provided. So what I, I will show you in GitHub is, is kind of a mirror of this, but I've distilled this down to some kind of very actionable, quick, pithy commands that you can run to get up and running in a Kubernetes, a Kubernetes cluster very, very quickly. The other, you know, I'll just kind of um, double down on this idea. Like I'm showing you Kubernetes, that is not to say that you have to run Cockroach in Kubernetes, right? Cockroach as a cluster can run in any sorts of technologies, but Kubernetes, as, as we all know, is very much a, a, an emerging and necessary technology uh, for, for certain workloads. So that's gonna be kind of the, what we show today, but again, we can run. You knew I was gonna ask you that question. I know, didn't you? I know. Yeah, exactly. I, I, it was, uh, so, so, so how much are you seeing Kubernetes worth for, you know, versus kind of like, other types of installs, Tim? Everywhere. You yeah, know, everybody's majority. talking about it. Um, I would say a majority of people that we are interacting with have it somewhere on their roadmap. They're either actively engaged yeah. in building out or have running microservices in Kubernetes or another containerization platform or are actively thinking about and talking about how to get there soon. Right. Uh, it is pervasive for yeah. sure. Now, again, what I'm going to show you is how to spin up a quick Kubernetes cluster running locally. Our documentation goes through how to do this in the various cloud providers. There are certainly lots of options on, on, on this technology stack. I'm just gonna go through kind of a very quick example of how to do this locally. Great. Okay. So I won't spend a lot of time on prereqs. I don't wanna sit here, have anybody watching me download things, uh, but there is a, you know, to run Kubernetes locally, there are a handful of technologies that you're gonna to wanna to have up and running. Uh, I've elected to do kubectl and minikube as kind of the way to get things started. I've already started a minikube instance uh, and that's that's running right now. So I'll just kind of go through the process of, of getting a cluster up and running. We're gonna use something called Helm, uh, a Helm chart to install Kubernetes. Uh, there's plenty of information out on the web about what Helm is. We have great documentation about how to use it for Cockroach. You don't have to use Helm by the way, but that's the, uh, that's the approach I've taken. And again, the idea here is do something very, very quickly. Uh, so uh, I've got uh, Minikube up and running. I'm just going to very quickly run Helm init. There's nothing more terrifying than doing a live demo, so bear with me. Um, but just we're going to quickly um, init Helm. It's already running. That's great. I would expect it to have done so. I'm also just going to update the Helm repo very, very quickly to make sure that I've gotten the latest and greatest of everything. So there could be an instance where you've got Helm running, you've had it running for a long time, you want to go ahead and run updates so you get the latest version of Cockroach. Now, Cockroach comes in two modes. Jim mentioned this, right? We can run in a secure mode or we can run in an insecure mode. For simplicity, I'm going to run through just running an insecure mode, but you're certainly welcome to experiment with this um, in, in a secure mode. So if I jump into here, I want to quickly go through some of the commands that we're going to do. And it literally is this simple. If I've gone through and gotten all my prerequisites installed, which I, I tend to enjoy using homebrew for Mac. You can do whatever you like, however you like. But once you have the prerequisites up and running, it's as simple as executing this command. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna create a three node cluster uh, of Cockroach in my local Kubernetes uh, cluster using, again, Helm. Makes it very, very uh, quick and easy to get running. And with that, my friends, uh, we're done. And so I can just come quickly, um, what is it? QCTL get pods. And what should I see? I should see, um, as it were, a handful of nodes already running. And you can see that that's happening right now. Um, and the commands and everything are in your GitHub repo. Yeah, that's all. I'm going to show you directly from yeah. GitHub. Is we go through um, the documentation does a, does a great job of kind of explaining this and a whole lot more. Uh, so there's there's plenty of material out there, but you can see. Uh, very quickly, um, we have a three node cockroach cluster. Uh, if I go back to kind of the overall readme, one of the things that you're gonna to wanna to do for at least running things locally is do a port forward, uh, port 8080. One of the things Jim mentioned is, you know, again, uh, cockroach is a single binary, which means we, uh, in that binary, not only providing uh, the database uh, and that technology, but actually uh, a, a monitoring interface or a web interface. So 
I'm port forwarding port 8080, and now uh, locally I should be able to come up and uh, and luckily it did work, right? It's a live demo. There we go. It works. So I have a three node cluster running in Kubernetes on my local environment, and now I have the ability to come and kind of take a look at what Cockroach offers you. And so um, before I kind of walk through the interface, which I think is important just to um, just to get people oriented, I'm going to do something else, which I think is kind of neat. So, um, whoops, wrong window there. Let me go back. Sorry, the power and the fear of live demoing. Oh, you're doing a great job. Um, Nothing really failed. So, cockroach, the, the cockroach binary that we ship obviously has lots of different uh, tools associated with it. Obviously, the UI that we're looking at here, we have a SQL command line interface. We've also spent a lot of time and energy creating something we call workload. And so, the reason behind developing workload is we wanted it wanted to provide a way for people not simply to spin up the cluster and, and take a look, but actually populate it with meaningful data uh, so that they could get a sense of, you know, how to create a schema, what a schema looks like, and then execute actual work on that schema so that you can see different things in the interface. And I'll do that very quickly without having to go run to a different team and figure out what schema to load and go figure out a way to load data, like workload will handle all of that for you. And so running in Kubernetes, it's really easy. Um, to execute workload commands. Again, I won't go into all the details here. This is all very, very nicely documented in not only GitHub, but in our documentation page as well. But the idea here is I can open up a different tab. I can execute a command. And what's this going to do? This is going to execute um, a quick, oh, oh that, that's fine. It, uh, I'd already created the database. But anyway, the idea here is it's going to create a bank database. I'm using the, the workload bank command. It's going to create a bank database and it could or should begin inserting data with this second. So command. basically it's just a workload that's simulating yeah. transactions and showing basically how, so we could show off the UI in a cool way Yeah, exactly. and, and start to experience this, right? And I just hit back instead of forward again, the beauty and power of live demos, right? Um, and so let me just copy this command. And what am I doing here? So I've created the bank database, and now I'm actually going to run some, some work over it. So if I come back to the, uh, the user interface, what I should begin to see is, uh, what well, now I have an actual database, right? I have a database that has been created, again, generated by our workload generator. And I should be able to start to see right, activity in the database. So again, you know, what's the reason we're providing this? Why are we doing this? Not only do we want it to make it very, very simple for you to start and run a cluster in any environment, but actually begin to use it and get a feel for the kinds of things that we provide mm -hmm. on the box. And so what are we providing here, right? We're providing a three node cluster that knows how to talk to itself, right? Talk to each other. Uh, this is a highly resilient cluster. I don't think I'll go into like failure scenarios, but in our documentation and certainly in the GitHub repo, we can do things like killing a node, right? Kill a node and watch what happens to a cockroach cluster. Well, what would you expect to happen? We continue to serve, you know, requests as if nothing were happening. That's the beauty of having three nodes serving this in something. No downtime, you still access all the right? data. Um, and so uh, three nodes running in Kubernetes on my local environment. And if I go over and, and look at our, our dashboard, you know, just kind of a quick highlight of some of the things we're seeing that I now see activity in this cluster. I see the SQL queries that are being executed. I can drill into not only uh, the cluster itself, but individual nodes. I have an overview. I have the ability to jump into hardware. I have to look at things like queues, replication, things that are important to a distributed database. I can drill specifically into SQL. What's my, you know, what's it? It's low level is what's my byte traffic. I mean, we provide a ton of great information right out of the box. Oh, by the way, all of this stuff is exposed via Prometheus. So if you want to hook this up into kind of your own monitoring system, you can certainly do that. Uh, we have the ability again to, you know, very quickly, what are the tables that have been created, right? Mm -hmm. And not only that, I think this is kind of interesting uh, or neat. We have this kind of statement fingerprint concept. So if you think about traditional databases, what are, you know, after everything's up and running, after you've loaded your data, after you've started to work with it, you want to know what's performing poorly or what's performing well and how do I debug that? And so we provide, I think, a really nice interface that shows you all the unique statements that have been running on the cluster. Um, over you know the last you know x number of hours, you can sort that in different ways. But you have the ability to drill into these statements and get a whole bunch of really interesting statistics about them. You know how many times has this statement been executed? What's the average number of rows that have been uh, impacted? What's my you know mean service latency? 
what nodes does this cluster or did this cluster have to run on? How, as a distributed database, did we take this query and parse it and plan it and run it? How long do we spend in each one of these stages? And, oh, by the way, here's a quick logical plan, right? We'll pre-fetch or pre-hydrate the logical plan of the SQL statement so that you can go in here and very quickly say, again, without having to get into kind of esoteric SQL commands, hey, is my query using an index, you know? Um, like it should be, or have I missed something, you know, in my configuration? So we kind of pre-hydrate all of this for you. Um, so it's a, it's a really, I think, um, user-friendly kind of data-rich interface that can get you all sorts of information about what we're doing. But again, if you don't want to use this, you want to pull data directly yeah. from the API. You can. So, so how much of this is, yeah, and it's, I love that it's the API, there's the UI as well. Is this all exposed to a CLI as well? It is. Yeah. It is. So that's kind of the great thing is if there are, you know, not only do we have the workload UI or the workload uh, command, we actually are working on something that's going to be announced shortly, demo command, which is kind of interesting yeah, to cool. get into. Uh, but we have a whole host of tools that you can um, you can manipulate and work with um, Cocker's database from the command line. That's cool. So Tim, this is like the UI and, and like as a, a mature database and sure. having all these things, it's, it's phenomenal. I, I, I feel, and I think the, the insight's great. What does it look like to the application developer? What does it look like on the other side? Like how, I mean, I, I know I don't want you to build an application right now, but like what are the things, you know, getting started with Cockroach TV, what do they've got to look out for? And what is, what is that, what, what's that story? What's that size? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And I think one that, that maybe we didn't spend enough time on, we, we really should. So Cockroach, it's a, it's a new database, right? It's, it's a, it's a different kind of animal, mm -hmm. uh, highly distributed, highly resilient, SQL based engine, right? But we're not shipping a, a new and unique driver. We're not creating a new and unique SQL language to express interaction with the database. It is for all practical purposes, uh, at least from an application developer perspective, a Postgres database. So why do I say that? We implement the PG wire protocol. That is how an application endpoint would talk to a cockroach database. To an application developer, you should think of this like a massively paralyzed uh, Postgres cluster. That, we don't even ship our own drivers. We simply leverage the Postgres community drivers that are available for a variety of different languages. So if you're familiar with Postgres or you're familiar with other kind of open source traditional databases, this is gonna be a very natural fit for you, very easy transition if you're a developer. We work very, very nicely with a whole host of ORMs. This is, this is again, well-documented on the site. So from our perspective or from my perspective, if you're familiar with Postgres, this is going to be dead simple to use because what is it to an application developer? It is a Postgres database. So Obviously, behind the scenes, very different. Yeah, and I think the integration point is important. What What are the some of the differences from like this? The SQL syntax point of view, right? Because I think that's something that I think people should be aware of, or is it just kind of the same? Well, it, it is kind of the same. I mean, the reality is we've been at this now for a number of years, and and the four team, and a half. Yeah, the team at Cockroach has spent, I, I would say, a lion's share of that, not only working on kind of the building blocks to enable a distributed database, but also working through Postgres compatibility. I mean, there's there's a lot of truth to that. So generally we talk about three things that we don't support. Beyond that, your traditional syntax for SQL is all there. You know, we don't do stored procedures. And mm -hmm. and some people, when we say that, you know. Uh, squirm, bristle, yeah, yeah squirm. squirm. We, don't, we don't do that today. Yeah. The other thing we don't support is triggers. And that's, you know, we can go into kind of all why that is and be happy to do that. Uh, but we have we have alternative recommendations for those kinds yeah. of things. And the other thing we're working on, don't have yet, is geospatial. But other than that, if you were to go down kind of what can Postgres provide to me uh, versus what cockroach from a SQL syntax perspective, it would be you'd feel very much at home. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm in agreement in all those points. I. I... I think in the modern world of microservices, uh, stored procedures should just be a microservice somewhere that's sitting really close to that data, right? I think there's there's architectural kind of patterns to, to, to architect out of that. So that's interesting, cool. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, while while we're having fun, how much time do we have? Do you wanna go off script a little oh, bit? Oh, you're gonna do that in a demo, Tim. It's I don't know, well, we don't know what's gonna happen. 33 right minutes now. past the hour. We don't know what's gonna happen, but I am gonna kill a node. I now. trust you. Why not? So let's kill a node. Whoops. So you just you're basically your kube kettle delete pod. Yeah. Pretty simple. We had a three node cluster. I'm hoping let's go. We yeah, have a suspect node. Uh oh. That must mean we stopped serving requests. Yeah. Did we? I would you just run. I killed a node. Does that mean our database is dead? Yes. Oh man. 
goods or no, services. You're fine. We're continuing to transfer. Yeah. This is the bank workflow. For, um, you know, if you're interested, it's kind of simulating bank transfer. So I lost a note here. I lost one third of my capacity. Um, an entire node is dead now completely, or at least was temporarily. Um, but we are continuing to serve serve nodes. Yeah. And and we're still we're continuing to serve all of the data as well, right? That's because right. what we're doing underneath the covers is we're, you know, we're using RAF to basically, you know, write data in triplicate across those, you know, three nodes, four nodes, ten, whatever you want, right? So that's right. And you know, no loss of data, no loss of access. And the interesting thing about Kubernetes, which everyone knows, is what do Kubernetes do, right? It automatically restarted the node. Yeah. Right. So you've got now I've got three nodes, <laughs> two of which have been up for eleven minutes, but the one I just killed got regenerated by Kubernetes automatically, right? I had, there's no manual intervention for me. My workload continued to function, right? My, 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 my no impact whatsoever. Um, and, and we are continuing cool. to generate. The other thing, just real quick, now we're way off script, but that's okay too, I suppose, is I will add a node. And this may not work, but it's, it's fun nonetheless to try. Um, but it, this kind of highlights some of the unique capabilities of, um, of Kubernetes and our ability to work natively in that space. And so I've scaled up my cluster, right? And what I should see, and in fact I do, luckily it did work, is that now my cluster is four nodes yeah. instead of three. And so, you know, the power of kind of cockroaches fundamentals that allow it to scale and distribute data so easily is like a perfect fit for Kubernetes. And maybe just to kind of bring the whole demo thing home, like this was really easy to do. Once I had all my prerequisites, I'm executing a single command, leveraging Helm to download and install my yes. cluster, and that was it. Yeah, interesting enough too, Tim, um, there's a lot of conversation around operators in the Kubernetes community. And yeah. I think, you know, what Rob Zemisky and the team has done at Red Hat about promoting them and making yeah. them kind of a, a really cool thing is really, really important. Um, you know, do we have an operator? We don't yet, but we're building one. Yeah. And, and the reality is we haven't gotten there yet because- We don't really need to do it. We don't really need to. Right. It was this easy to do, right? Mm -hmm. We can accomplish a lot of this with kind of the primitives that exist today, right? Um, and and I think you know we're happy to, to have more conversations about that, and we're certainly doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it didn't have to do it. Didn't have to create one yeah. to get up and running. And, and I think it just really comes back to like the, the architecture of CockroachDB and the architecture from just distributed systems in general, and the way that these things work, the core principles of which are followed in Kubernetes are a lot of the same core principles that are followed here. In fact. You know, the genesis of CockroachDB is really in the, the Spanner white paper as well, which, you know, Spanner was, you know, that's Spanner is to Borg as CockroachDB is to Kubernetes is, is what I think, you know, yep. what's the generally consumable outside of, you know, um, Google, uh, how do you, how do you create a database like this? And so I think it's, it's phenomenal. So cool. You're, you're done. You're, I'm you're not going to go out. You're, that was pretty good. You went off the ranch. I'm pretty happy on you. I'm pretty happy it all worked out for you. Yeah. That would have been very so. Bad. All right, cool. Let me just wrap this up. I'll go back to the slides here. How do I go back to him? I, I, it's not my, you know. It's the benefit of sitting next to you while we do this. Cool. Great. So as I noted before, you know, common distributed architecture with Kubernetes, it's kind of one of the big takeaways. I think if you're deploying things like this, this is, we did err on the side of the Kubernetes stuff because honestly, it makes some of this stuff really beautiful, and really clean, kind of easy to do. So. Um, we're happy to help you through this whole process. I, I think, you know, you know, installing CockroachDB, just, you know, for spinning up three instances is equally as easy. Um, I've got to give uh, tremendous kudos to our documentation team. You know, when I started here at CockroachDB or Cockroach Labs, excuse me, um, the documentation itself is what I learned how to do this stuff. So uh, it, it's incredible. And there's a couple of pieces of documentation that I think would be, would be valuable. Um, we have a couple of links here. I know we're going to share them with you all uh, after the webinar. They'll be in the presentation deck as well, of course. Um, there is a webinar on actually deploying multi-region Kubernetes, which is a, a question that comes up often with us. Um, you know, my friend Alex Robinson did that with us a, a while back. He's, he's been a wonderful advocate of the company. And then the GitHub repo that, that Tim was pulling some of his commands from is, is here as well. So that's just GitHub Tim Vail dash cockroach. And you can find the Kubernetes example folder there that, with lots of material. So Tim has opened up all that to you as well. Um, we're always happy to get on the phone or answer things in our forum or engage with you to get started with, with, with CockroachDB. Um, you know, for us, you know, we're wildly excited about this technology. 
we're wildly excited about you know the future of databases and what we see uh, is happening over the next five to ten years and, and we just feel that this architecture is is definitely a candidate for for what needs to be done to kind of define the way we think about data and the way we think about database and relational in particular uh, in, in this new kind of global and, and cloud distributed systems world. So um, with that, I do have one last slide. Please do. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we are also big fans of, of the cloud, of course, what we're doing. Um, it, we're we're going to host a conference here in New York City uh, next month called the Escape Conference, Escape 19. Uh, this is not a Cockroach Labs conference. Uh, we're putting it on, but this is a, a general conference about the cloud. Um, you know, outside of the context of the large cloud providers, let's have an open forum and an open conversation around all those things that, that we think about in terms of how do we use multiple different clouds in our organization? Uh, what does it truly mean to be multi-cloud and not just the technical point of view? What does it mean from a legal point of view and finance and, and an administration and hiring? How do you even know which services are being used across the various different pieces in your team? You're naturally multi-cloud today. By the way, hybrid cloud is just a flavor of multi-cloud, I feel. Um, and so we're going to have a conference here. Um, you know, we, we've lined up an am amazing group of speakers. Uh, some of them have already been uh, listed at escapeconference.io. I would implore anybody to go check that out uh, and, and join us here in New York City uh, next month. And because you stayed with us and listened to Tim and me uh, through this whole webinar, myself, Jim too, by the way, um, we are offering a 20% discount for you through this webinar. So if you, if you do register, just use the code webinar. Uh, you'll get 20% off your admissions. Uh, it's it's a nominal fee. And I, I think it's really, I'm, I'm excited because I think this is the first time this show's ever been done. Oh, and by the way, it's also an East Coast cloud show, which I'm yet to see of an East Coast cloud show. So, so we're excited about that. We'd love to have you join us as well. So with that, again, um, Tim, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, I, I love doing webinars with you. Um, and, and I'm honored to do them with you. I'll do them anytime. Um, so we'll send an email link with the, with the replay uh, information. And then please, if you could, please complete the survey. We would love to hear feedback about, about what's going on. So with that, thank you very much and have a great day.